I always get the job following that. I... <laughs> Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. Thank you for coming out today on this, this beautiful spring day. Uh, and welcome to those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, what a gift it is to be able to use our technology to spread our philosophy and the way we look at the world and the way we believe in changing the world. Um, I kind of wrestled with the topic this week and the whole talk. This being Palm Sunday, uh, it was like inside I knew, oh, I should be doing my usual thing and the symbolism of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And boy, I just kept pulling away. And I, Don, you've given that about five times. <laughs> I don't think you need to do it again today. And our topic for the month is diversity and inclusion. and that kept pulling at me too and and that's really a hard topic it's not easy to do i thought back to a time in ministerial school and uh one of my uh, many instructors uh, was a guy by the name of dr roger teal he's the senior minister at mile high in denver it's a mega church of like eight thousand members and roger told a story about his mentor, who was Dr. Fred Vogt, and he told this about how uh, Dr. Fred told him, and he said, uh, Roger, there's two things that you need to do. You need to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and so today, I'm not going to do my usual positive rah-rah talk. I'm going to do the latter. I'm going to maybe afflict the comfortable. I'm going to talk about privilege. Um, this was a letter that was published in a thing called uh, the Players Tribune. It was uh, written by Kyle Corver, who is a basketball player with the uh, Salt Lake City uh, Jazz. And it's long, so forgive me, but it's, there is no other way. When the police break your teammate's leg, you think it would wake you up a little. When they arrest him on a New York street, throw him in jail for the night, leave him with a season-ending injury, you think it would sink in. You think you'd know that there was more to the story. You'd think. But nope. I still remember my reaction when I first heard what happened to Thabo. It was 2015, late in the season, and Thabo and I were teammates on the Hawks, and we'd flown to New York late after a game in Atlanta. When I woke up the next morning, our team group text was going nuts. Details were still hazy, but the guys were saying, Thabo hurt his leg during an arrest? Wait, he spent the night in jail? Everyone was upset and confused. Well, almost everyone. My response was different. I'm embarrassed to admit it, which is why I want to share it today. Before I tell the rest of this story, just let me say real quick, Thabo wasn't some random teammate of mine or some guy in the league who I knew a little bit. We'd come to become legitimate friends that year in our downtime. He was my go-to teammate to talk about stuff beyond the basketball world, politics, religion, culture, you name it. Thabo brought a perspective that wasn't typical of an NBA player, and it's easy to see why. Before we were teammates in Atlanta, the guy had played professional ball in France and Turkey and Italy. He spoke three languages. Thabo's mother was from Switzerland, his father was from South Africa, and they lived in South Africa uh, before Thabo was born, but they had to leave because of apartheid. It didn't take me long to figure out that Thabo was one of the most interesting people that I'd ever been around. We truly respected each other. We were cool, you know. We had each other's backs. Anyway, on the morning that I found out that Thabo had been arrested, want to know what my first thought was about my friend and my teammate? My first thought was, what was Thabo doing out at a club and the night on a back-to-back? -back? Yeah, not how he's doing, not what happened during the arrest, not something seems off 
with this story. Nothing like that. Before I knew the full story and before I'd even had a chance to talk to Thabo, I sort of blamed Thabo. I thought, well, if I'd been in Thabo's shoes out at a club late at night, the police wouldn't have arrested me. Not unless I was doing something wrong. Cringe. It's not like it was a conscious thought. It was pure reflex. The first thing to pop into my head. And I was worried about him, no doubt, but still cringe. A few months later, the jury found Thabo not guilty on all charges. He settled with the city over NYPD's use of force, and then the story just sort of disappeared. It fell away from the news. Thabo had surgery, went through rehab, and pretty soon another NBA season began, and we're, we were back on the court again. Life went on but I still couldn't shake my discomfort. I mean, I hadn't been involved in the incident. I hadn't even been there. So why did I feel like I had let my friend down? Why did I feel like I had let myself down? Well, a few weeks ago, something happened at a jazz home game that brought back many of these old memories. Like I say, this was just published a week or so ago, and, and I remember this incident that he's going to talk about. Maybe you saw it. We were playing against the Thunder and Russell Westbrook and a fan in the crowd exchanged words during the game. I didn't actually see or hear what happened. And then if you were following on TV or on Twitter, maybe you had a similar initial viewing of it. Then after the game, one of the reporters asked me for my response to what had gone down between Russ and the fan. I told him I hadn't seen it. And then I added something like, but you know Russ, he gets into it with the crowd quite a bit. Of course, the full story came out later that night. What actually happened was that a fan had said some really ugly, nasty things at close range to Russ. Russ had then responded. And after the game, he said he felt that the comments were racially charged. The incident struck a nerve with our team. In a closed door meeting with the president of the Jazz the next day, my teammates shared stories of similar experiences they, that they had had, of feeling degraded in ways that went beyond acceptable heckling. One teammate talked about how his mom had called him right after the game, concerned for his safety in Salt Lake City. One teammate said that the night felt like being in a zoo and one of the guys in the meeting was Thabo. He's my teammate in Utah now. I looked over at him and I remembered his night in New York City. And a lot of this I'm gonna have to leave out because it's, it's really long and I before the meeting ended, I joined the team's demand for a swift, re swift response and a promise from the Jazz organization that it would address the concerns that we had. I think my teammates and I all felt that it was a step in the right direction, but I don't think anyone felt satisfied. There's an elephant in the room that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few weeks. It's the fact that demographically, if we're really being honest, I have a lot more in common with the fans in the crowd at your average NBA game than I have with the players on the court. And after the events in Salt Lake City last month, as we've seen discussing them since, I really started to recognize the role that those demographics play in my privilege. It's like, I may be Th Thabo's friend, or Epke's teammate or Russ's colleague, I may work with these guys and I absolutely 100% stand with them, but I look like the other guy. And whether I like it or not, I'm beginning to understand how that means something. What I'm realizing is no matter how passionately I commit to being an ally and no matter how unwavering my support is for the NBA and WNBA <laughs> players of color, I'm still in this conversation from the privileged perspective of opting into it. Which of course means that on the flip side, I could just as easily opt out of it. Every day I'm given that choice. I'm granted that privilege based on the color of my skin. In other words, I can say everything right in the world. I can voice my solidarity with Russ after what happened in Utah. I can evolve my position on what happened to Thabo in New York. I can condemn every racist heckler I've ever known. 
but I can also fade into the crowd and I can face, my face can blend in with the faces of hecklers any time I want. But as disgraceful as it is that we have to deal with racist hecklers in the NBA arenas in 2019, the truth is you could argue that that kind of racism is easier to deal with. Because at least in those cases, the racism is loud and clear. There's no ambiguity, not in the act itself, not thankfully in the response. We can throw the guy out of the building and then we ban him for life. But in many ways, the more dangerous kind of racism isn't that loud and stupid kind. It isn't that kind that announces itself when it walks into the arena. It's the quiet and subtle kind. The kind that almost hides itself in plain view. It's the person who does and says all of the right things in public. They're perfectly friendly when they meet a person of color. They're very polite, but in private, well, they sort of wish that everyone would stop making everything about race all the time. I'm going to leave it at that. He says, and I believe it's the responsibility of everyone on the privileged end of those inequalities to help make things right. The title of my talk today is Beloved and Different. And uh, I only have two points today. Talk about privilege and then unique and perfect. Last week, I defined privilege as the unearned benefit from membership in a majority. And we tend to think of privilege in bigger terms. Generally, we think of it in terms of race. And we think of uh, white privilege. But it can extend to so many more things. The bigger areas that we sometimes think of it in can include not only race, but gender, uh, and sometimes even sexual preference. Other areas that maybe we don't think quite so much through that way include age, educational level, disability, marital status, skill level, gender. Wow, that is so prevalent in our world. We talk about women trying to break the glass ceiling in a predominantly male-dominated area, how does it feel to be the only woman sitting at a board table? Sexual preference. We're becoming more and more accepting of different sexual preferences, but make no mistake, if you're in a room of heterosexual people and you're gay, you're different. But it works the other way, too. If you are straight and you are in a room of gay people, either gays or lesbians or transgenders, you are the one that's different. And you can recognize privilege. Age. Wow. We group together in ages. Educational level. Marital status. Singles are sitting over here. The marrieds are sitting over here. Skill level, I, I uh, as you know, I, I love fly fishing and I was, uh, had the opportunity a few years ago uh, out at uh, Brooks, one of my favorite places, um, they gather with some people and it occurred to me that they were in two totally separate camps. Those that could cast a fly accurately at 40 or 60 feet and those that couldn't. They were in two separate things based solely on skill level. We, atten we tend to associate with people who are like us. Friday night, we had game night here. And if you miss that, um, you really miss something special. Uh, and the 
evidence of diversity was so great in that room. We had elders that were playing with little kids. We had people of color, we had white people. I mean, we had gay, straights, we had every divider that you could have all in the room at the same time. We did one thing together and that was we had fun. And I got beat by every 12 year old at every game. <laughs> <laughs> But Lynn pointed out that we used to have that all the time. And, and I think it's going to come back. Oh, some of the kids were clamoring for it weekly. I don't think <laughs> we'll do that. But it sure may become monthly. Um, and I was feeling really good about the, the diversity and the way we were and everything. And then we had a practitioner meeting the next day. And once again, Lynn took us through an exercise that was like a pail of cold water thrown in my face and I realized how I absolutely flocked together with the birds that are like me. I swear, if we had a bald men's society, I'd probably be in it. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. I'm not nearly as inclusive as I thought because I do tend to flock with people that are like me. So how are we going to get away from this? Most of these uh, areas of privilege, we're not even aware of it. We, we don't even know that they're there. And, and if nothing else, I hope that, that Kyle's letter or essay, whatever that was, can strike home to you because he finally discovered that he is of privilege. And regardless of whether we are in the majority or a minority in any given situation, there are going to be generally more of one type of individual than others, and those that are in the majority have the privilege. And when we're in that privilege, it's how we behave that makes the difference. Um, Mirabi Starr. Uh, wrote a book and it's called Wild Mercy. It's just new on the market. It, this, uh, the first quote here is from one of the characters in the book. Love and justice are not two. Without inner change, there can be no outer change. Without collective change, no change matters. So if we're going to affect a change in the world, if we are going to actually do something about privilege, it's got to start in here. And we have to become aware of it to begin with. And then the author goes on to say, only in doing our inner work can we hope to be agents of change in the world. One of the ways that we are attempting or going to attempt to do something about that, and this is just in the very uh, infancy stages, it's just in the formulation stage, but I think we're going to have a book study this summer. And it's not going to be a big, highly, you know, intensive class with homework and things, but it's going to be a book study and it's going to be on one of the many facets of uh, diversity and inclusion. So I think that's going to go this summer. We, we will have a, a summer class after all. Okay, my point number two is recognize that each one of us is unique and perfect. Ernest Holmes in our Texas Science of Mind wrote, each individual, however, is a unique variation in the universe. No two people are alike, and yet all people are rooted in that which is identical. All people are rooted in that which is identical. I, to me, that s says so much. The miracle of cell division, the miracle of uh, how we become. We are created from identical cells, identical in every way, the DNA, the parts of every cell, and they divide, and yet somehow they know to divide. Some cells become skeleton material, some cells become nerve, some become digestive systems. How do they know? Because they're identical. <laughs> unique and perfect. But you may say, Don, I'm just an average guy, you know. 
But that's the way I look at it. I, there's nothing special about me. I don't have anything great to offer. What's the, what's the deal with that? And I submit that each and every one of us does have something great to offer. And your job is to discover what that is and let it out. Maybe it's a poetic song that's uplifting on a day when the talk is decidedly downer. <laughs> Who knows? But we all, each one of us, have that something beautiful within us, something perfect that's different. And we say that throughout literature. We see it so many different places. You know, I don't know why I've been seen stuck on David and Goliath. But, you know, the good example is the story of David and Goliath. He was just a shepherd boy taking care of dad's sheep. You know, and uh was it saul came to him and said you know you're going to be the king me the king i don't think so you know, i can't do anything all i can do is a slingshot because i'm out here watching sheep all day and there's rocks all over the place and i practice with my slingshot well it was his slingshot that changed history his ability to hit the the giant right between the eyes no, it isn't a great skill. It isn't a great leadership thing. It's not something that's going to elevate him to be the, you know, the great king or whatever it was. But it's the skill that he had. And each one of us have a skill. Maybe it's not some great thing. Maybe it's only skill with a slingshot. But we all have a slingshot skill. And our job is to use it. And to not recognize that, that we have something within us is to somehow admit that God made a mistake. That the divine force of the air, the universe, the infinite intelligence that's behind of all everything, did everything perfect until it got to you and it made its uh, first mistake. Do you really believe that? that? That the universe has made a mistake with you or with anyone else? I don't think so, because everything this far has fit together in a perfect clockwork synchronicity. Why would all of a sudden we have sand in the gears of eternity? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. What makes sense is that we all have a gift, and we all get to use it. You are fully loaded. You have everything that you need. Moses, another good example. You know. Moses saw the burning bush and went out and God told him that he's going to lead the people out of Israel, you know, or lead the people out of Egypt. And what, me? No, no, not me. I, 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 I stutter. I, I couldn't possibly do that. But God said, yes, you will. And if you stutter, I'll get somebody else to speak for you. But you are the leader. You are going to do it. And he wake up, woke up and he took that responsibility and he did it. So what do I want you to take away today? It's that each one of us are unique. We are absolutely different. And in that difference lies our strength. And it is in that strength that we can come together to build a better world. Find out what your gift is and use it. And I'll close with this final quote. This is from Ernest Holmes as well. We live in a world of cause and effect. We are limited by nothing but our belief. If we believe that the condition that we are experiencing is unchangeable, so it is. But if we believe that there is a power and a presence greater than any condition and a law that operates perfectly for everyone alike, then we can apply the teachings of science of mind to create a different experience than the one that we are currently in. And so it is with an awareness of that inherent divinity that is within each and every one of us that I ask my colleagues, the practitioners, to join me in, in holding our congregation in love and light and simply knowing that within the vast diversity that is in this universe, there is a pattern that is absolutely perfect. And that pattern is perfect on the large scale and it is perfect in the individual scale. 
that we live in a universe that is so abundant, so vast, we can't even imagine. And yet within our own individual lives, we can experience lack and limitation, but we can change that condition by fully understanding the breadth and the depth of the vastness of the universe in which we live and embracing that which is so vast. Same thing with our health. We know that there's an infinite intelligence behind all that is. And that infinite intelligence works at the cosmic level, it works at the universal level, it works at the individual level. It works within us, it works within ourselves, within our very DNA, within the atoms, and the subatomic particles within us. There is that intelligence, and it is that intelligence that we call on to create, to embrace that blueprint that is perfect, perfect health for each person that is experiencing the appearance, the condition of disease. And finally, I speak my word for those who are experiencing separation, separation from one another, separation from God. We just simply know that it's impossible to be separate from God. For that indwelling presence is within each of us at every moment. We cannot be separated from that infinite intelligence. We cannot be separated from God. So we cannot be separated from one another. So we can move past the appearance, the condition of separation, whether it be at work, within our families, any relationship, romantic, friends, makes no difference because it's all God. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks for our awareness of the power and the presence of the divine within our lives at this and in every moment. And so it is. So it is.